We are so fortunate to live in a community with so many conservation areas that reflect the natural beauty of our open spaces, woodlands, and coastal habitat. In just a few minutes, we will visit one of those places that you will definitely want to go back and see for yourself someday. Welcome to Trails of Discovery with your co-host, Bob Miller and Sky Thaxter. Trails of Discovery is a series which explores our natural resources that exist practically in your backyard here in Hingham and our surrounding communities. Today, we're going to visit Aaron River Reservoir Park located on the eastern side of Wampatuck State Park with stretches going into Hingham and Situate. You can access Aaron River Reservoir from Wampatuck State Park with its entrance on Union Street in Hingham or from Cohasset at the end of Beechwood Street with limited parking. The Aaron Reservoir and Cohasset Water Treatment Plant were built between 1976 and 78 by the Cohasset Water Department to supplement its water supply at nearby Lily Pond. Lily Pond has served as the town's major water and drinking supply since the 1880s. In order to excavate this whole area and build a dam and reservoir, it was necessary to remove all vegetation and trees and naturally porous soils and get down to the bedrock. 60,000 yards of impervious soil was compacted into the core of the dam. Recreational uses of this area are open to non-motorized boats, kayaks, canoes, and fishing. Swimming is not allowed. In the wintertime, you can ice fish and skate if the ice is safe. Aaron Reservoir also provides a habitat for waterfowl, fish, and other wildlife. As we approach the entrance to Aaron Reservoir Park, you need to be sure that you dress properly for this time of year. And don't forget to bring your camera. Today we see Sky is dressed warmly and in layers. He is wearing jeans or warm pants with hiking shoes and wool socks. On top he has on a turtleneck, sweater or fleece, and an outer layer or jacket which is waterproof and wind resistant. He is also wearing a woolen ski hat and fleece gloves. He carries a backpack that contains his water, snack, and sunscreen. Because of the potential for tick exposure, try to wear lightly colored clothes and tuck your pant legs into your socks as seen here with Sky. The deer tick, as seen here, can carry Lyme disease and other infections. With us today by popular demand is Steve Ivis. Steve is a naturalist and wetland scientist. Well, thank you very much for inviting me today, uh, Sky and uh, Bob. 
We're here at the Aran River Reservoir and Dam. It was constructed in 1976 through 1978. It's a dam that's 900 feet long, 25 feet high, and it holds back 133 acres of water. The maximum capacity here on the rock is 323 million gallons. The watershed area is 3,270 acres, and it comprises four towns, Cohasset, Hingham, Norwell, and Situate. Used to be that the Aran River would flow through this area and down to Bound Brook and then out to Cohasset Harbor and Mushquashet uh, uh, Stream right in Cohasset Harbor area. Uh, now it's been dammed up and it's an area that you would have a very difficult time permitting these days. In fact, uh, one town south of here in Situate, they are trying to go through the permitting process to, uh, to make the, the dam at Tack Factory Pond a couple of feet higher and they're going to have a lot of permitting issues. So they did this at the right time. It's now a drinking water source for the town of Cohasset. Let's take a walk down the dam. I'm here uh, down at the toe of slope of the dam, and we're looking at an area that has grown up since 1978 with uh, some various invasive species as well as some locally um, <clears throat> wetland species, local wetland species. This right here is particularly uh, brilliant today with the nice sun on it. It's called common winterberry. It's, uh, it's a beautiful red berry that has high wildlife value. Uh, right next to me here is the dreaded black swallowwort. It's in the milkweed family and it's also called dog strangler vine. Uh, very terrible invasive uh, here. We've got autumn olive as well, which is an invasive species. And then we've got some uh, large aspens that are probably only a, less than 10 years old growing here. We've also got eastern white pine that's growing. And behind me, there are uh, some cattails growing in this area. And if you can get the camera over to look at the orange water, orange colored water, this is um, iron bacteria that's in the water uh, and iron. In anaerobic conditions without any oxygen, iron is soluble in water. In aerobic conditions, it precipitates out uh, and it changes state from a plus two to plus three. And there are bacteria that actually use the energy off that change in state to live and to, and, and to feed on. So we have some iron bacteria in the water here, probably halfway over to the fishway uh, on the dam, about halfway over to the dam. I'm standing on the fishway. Um, there's always water running through the fishway here, although we haven't seen any herring because we have a couple of dams. Uh, one was just taken down two years ago in Situate. Uh, and in the summertime, we don't have much water coming through the area. But I'm also here, if you can hear the overflow of the pond itself, and that means that it's rained in the past few days, and the pond is up. Okay, we're in uh, the park now, right off of Beechwood Street, at the end of Beechwood Street, and we're walking along this old uh, road, perhaps. We've just come over a, a bridge that was made of granite, granite almost posts here. We're walking on what looks like a bermed area an old woods road, probably, uh, you know, a couple hundred years old here. Uh, to our left is the dam in this area, and we can see 
all the brush that has developed at the toe of the dam and across the small stream that emanates from the other uh, overflow here yeah. on the east, I'm sorry, the western side of the dam. You see all the brush here that's grown up since the construction project. Okay, we're coming to our first trail intersection and we've got some large east and white pines and we've got the uh, American beach right here at the corner. We're taking a right-hand turn and going on to another trail. So we are on a trail here just past the B6 identifier that's on a trail behind us. We're standing uh, three quarters of the way up a slope and in front of us are some very large uh, cobble size and boulder size uh, rocks that have been exposed by stormwater that's coming down from the northerly side here. Um, the, the trail itself is relatively flat until you get to the top of the slope here and then the slope comes down a little ways and then it steepens and in the steepened area the water has eroded out the middle of the trail probably by a couple of feet so it shows you the water damage that can happen in storm events uh, if the trail is not protected from erosion and that's what's happened here so now it's very difficult to tread it's very dangerous uh, underfoot it's small cobbles there We've come to this tree that has a lot of growth on the bark of the tree. Uh, yes, we've just taken a left-hand turn and we have a northern red oak here. And obviously we've got some really interesting growth. It's lichens, which is a mix of an algae and a fungus. We've got mosses growing on the tree here at the bottom, at the base. And then we've got this mushroom here that's, that's actually eating the interior of the tree. Um, and it's called a brachiophyte. It's, um, some people call it a turkey tail fungus as well. This, there are many types of brachiophytes, many different species. And they are really interesting. Some are colored. I've seen orange. Uh, you probably know uh, chicken of the woods is an orange fungus. I'm told it's edible. Uh, as you know, there are old mushroom hunters and there are bold mushroom hunters, but there are no old, bold mushroom hunters. Oh, guys, take a look. We've got some slime mold. This is a mold that uh, we see uh, oftentimes after rainstorms, if you're looking really carefully, and uh, it actually does sometimes move. Um, it's actually using the branch as its food source. Here I am uh, just east of the R4 sign on the trail uh, in an area that looks pretty dry right now. What happens in the spring is this fills up and may become a vernal pool where some obligate creatures like spotted salamanders and wood frogs use it as a not only the meeting place or the bar what I call the bar then the bedroom and then the nursery for the small lava of both of those species at the edge of this pool uh, very close to a granite outcrop is a holly tree right here and I'm going to walk over here it's growing just above what I consider probably the height of the water during the uh, growing season, during the springtime. And next I'm going to show you something else that's in here, which is a blueberry plant. It's a shrub that's growing right here at the toe of slope of this small island. The island has red maple trees and a snag uh, looks like a snag eastern white pine there, a standing dead tree. In front of me here, 
we have a, uh, a black birch lying on the ground. Uh, the snag is the standing dead tree, and this is called a log. I'm just a few feet away in the same little vernal pool area, and I'm looking at a red maple here that's got a buttressed root system. As you can see, the roots come out away from the tree, and there's, uh, there's some moss on, on, the tr on the tree here, and there's some adventitious branches as well here. This buttressed root um, is an adaptation to high groundwater. So oftentimes we'll see this in vernal pool areas and close to ponds, lakes, and streams. Here I am with my left hand on a snag. A snag uh, is a standing dead tree as defined by the foresters. This one happens to be an eastern white pine of about six inches DBH. DBH means diameter breast height, which is right about here. Turns out that right at breast height is some more slime mold. This one's a, a bright yellow color that's just uh, feeding on the bark and the lichen on this particular snag. Steve, we've come to a tree that hasn't lost its leaves yet. Yes, Bob, this is an American beech tree. We're also very close to the vernal pool still. That reminds me of a story about the beech tree. Uh, yes, a young, uh, young Native American uh, boy uh, wanted to ask the chief for his daughter's hand. And the chief responded, yes, I'll, I'll provide you my daughter's hand when the leaves drop from the beech trees. And do they ever drop? Well, the winter leaves will drop sometimes after the summer leaves come on. So no, they never drop. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Steve, we've come to this ledge rock. Uh, yes, this is a ledge, and we're very close to R2 on the trail, and this is a ledge that's been exposed now for the last 10,000 years. And what we have is we have a series of lichens that are all over the rock, many different types and species. We've got some mosses in here. We've got some sedges and grasses, and we've got rock polyploidy. Uh, eventually, this rock will be covered, if we don't have another ice age, this rock will be covered with soil and you'll see trees growing out of it. We've come to a tree with very interesting bark. Yes, these are very deep furrows. And frankly, I have not seen a sassafras this large on this site at all. This is quite an old sassafras, and look at how deep the furrows are in the bark. Uh, this is a very large sassafras. I don't see any others around it here. In fact, when we look up, we can see some dead um, eastern hemlocks that have been attacked by the woolly adelgid. We're losing all our hemlocks, so our forest is going to, are going to change. Uh, in the next few years radically. Is sassafras used for anything? Uh, yes, I understand its roots are used for root beer. In fact, my great-grandmother used to make it. I'm standing here on the secondary dam um, for the reservoir. This is another spot just to the west of the main dam of the reservoir, very close to Wampatuck State Park behind me. And we have a plethora of vegetation 
along this earthen fill dam here. And what I'm going to do is describe from the water up. So in the water, growing actually in the water a few inches, is a plant called button bush. And these are the seeds of the button bush right here. Um, it's got an interesting globular flower in the summertime. It's a quite, quite beautiful white globular flower. Also in the water is uh, our dread Phragmites common reed, also an invasive. And while I'm on the invasives, uh, we have the purple loosestrife growing right here at pretty much the high water mark of the pond here. Uh, right at the high water mark also is meadowsweet uh, spirea, one of the sp many spireas. Uh, this is probably the white one here. And we have this red stemmed plant is a dogwood, probably the silky dogwood, Conus amomum, also a wetland plant. And we have a little eastern white pine trying to grow right here at the water's edge, along with some deer tongue grass, which is a wetland species also. And right behind me here is a, a plant called maleberry. Some people mistake it for blueberry because the the stems look like a blueberry stem, that, that light orange-brown. But if you look at the seed pods, you'll see that they're all round here. I'm not sure if you can see those in the camera or not, but they're round seed pods. And the leaves are very similar to a blueberry leaf. Uh, further up the uh, hillside here, we've got some Canada goldenrod probably right here. We've got some gray birch growing in. Uh, gray birch loves to grow in sunny spots. Uh, we have some honey locust. This honey locust has spines on it, so uh, don't get too close, and it is an invasive as well. Uh, we also have some, uh, some northern red oak growing here, and on the bottom, on the herbaceous level, we have some dewberry. Uh, and some other herbaceous species. We've come to a large ledge rock here at the end of the dam, which has some very interesting growth on it. Uh, yes, indeed, Bob. This has a couple of different species of lichen here. We've got a light-colored green, a dark-colored green, and then we've got this brown stuff. This is called rock tripe. It's another species of lichen, and this is what uh, George Washington's troops had to eat uh, when they were near crossing the river, uh, the Delaware River. Um, I'm told it tastes like shoe leather. I haven't tasted it. Uh, it needs to be boiled first. Uh, you'll see it flattened on the rock in, when it's really dry. And we've just had some rain, so it actually comes away from the rock here. So you can see it's, it's quite a bit uh, removed from the rock. Looking up the rock here, we see trees, a couple of different species of trees. As I said, ecological succession has taken place faster on this rock than it has on the other ledge rock we saw at the last stop. They're growing right on top of the rock. Absolutely, because the lichen have made it good for the mosses to grow. The mosses have made it good for the grasses to grow. The grasses have grown, died, and created some of the soil and then the trees go right on that soil on the rock. It's a fantastic uh, display of succession on rocks. We've come to an interesting granite rock which has black speckles in it. Uh, yes, Bob. This, this is part of the Cohasset granite. 
It happens to be 599 million years old, mm. plus or minus 2 million, the geologists tell me, a uh, geologist that grew up here in Cohasset, Peter Dillon. Um, and you can see the black speckles are iron oxide that cooled very slowly. It's called hematite here. This rock is part of a huge system that goes all the way back to Great Blue Hill uh, in Milton Quincy area and also comes over, over to Cohasset and goes under the ocean at Sand Beach. All the beaches south of there uh, have literally sand on them. Uh, all the beaches north are very rocky. It's a rocky coast. So this was part of a part of a volcano system that moved uh, 600 million years ago or so. And right over there is Wampatuck State Park. And I understand that's Hingham, and there is a boat ramp that was the end of Beechwood Street, which is where we came in from when we first started on this trail walk. Exactly, and I think I can see it from here. Well, Steve, this has been quite an adventure. Yes, guys, thanks for having me. Well, I'm afraid it's that time to say goodbye until next time on Trails of Discovery. Goodbye.